Good evening, everyone. Time for episode seven of the Drums of Doom, part two of the Duarte Heemstaff saga by me, starting on page 74. We'll reread a little bit of last episode. Okay. His burns brought pain, pain enough to stop lesser men, fuel to a man such as him. Their eyes showed their uncertainty. They feared him now. Surely they had never encountered an enemy such as him on any prior battlefield. Attempting to regroup, they tried to organize themselves against him. Rigid discipline and military training was obviously one key to their history of conquest. This was despite the fact that they prayed to a chaotically evil, disembodied brain. Clearly shaken by his skill at arms, they tried valiantly to steal their resolve. They knew that in order to defeat him, many more of them would have to die. But the great mind's punishment for their failure would be certain death, and so they pressed on. Remick's orders screamed in their minds, Bring him down, now! They attacked him then, with the hopeless determination that fate's resolve brings. Their enemy seemed to be nowhere and everywhere. His swords cut mercilessly, and his body danced a ballet of death's design. How could he move so, they thought. Confusion reigned as one by one they fell to cuts that they never even saw delivered. Whenever possible, the elf seemed to cripple rather than to kill, but when his hand was forced, heart's blood ebbed and heads rolled. Olak's blades were drenched in blood. Even the hidden razors in his braid were dripping with the liquid of life. Pausing for an instant to survey his work, his eyes looked upon Dravian and turned black. The sorcerer had had enough. Fading, he fled into the astral plane. Fear had overcome even his evil soul, and somehow death by Vermic's hand seemed a gentler thing. The subordinate knights that still breathed also disappeared. Some would surely die of their wounds, but perhaps one or two would live to fight another day. Shaking the gore from his swords, Olak wiped them off upon an enemy's cloak. Breathing deep, he calmed himself. Jason was in a bit of a pickle, but help was on the way. Draco pressed hard his attack upon Vremic. Using all his vast training, he focused only upon the fight. Vremic tried hard to contact his mind, but he would have none of it. Cut, slash, chop. Parry, slice, twist, sidestep, and repeat. He allowed rage to shield his mind. Kill Vremick was all that he allowed his mind to say to itself. Vremick knew that his <clears throat> attempt to recover the sword was failing. Somehow the elves were largely immune to their psychic abilities. He could never return to Yersai without the sword of Ilion, but he could stay in the field, retreat and regroup, and perhaps gain reinforcements. They would lose face, but they might live. They must live to exact vengeance against the son of de Gaulle. His knights tried hard to capture Jason in their snare, but the sword's power allowed him to, to escape easily. The black elves were regrouping to overwhelm them. The day was lost, but they were the soldiers most loyal to Vremick, and they would not surrender. Vremick spoke to the last remnants of his force with his, with his mind. The hour of our defeat has come, but the war isn't over. We will retreat to the astral plane, regroup, and return for the sword with a stronger force. <sighs> Fall back on my command, now. Each of his remaining warriors then retreated, became ethereal, and passed between the plains to their homeland. It was not merely a spiritual journey, for their material forms traveled there as a whole. One moment they existed in one plane, and the next they were gone, whole for a moment, ghost, a ghostly spirit the next, and then vanishing, going from one reality to the next without physical movement. They chose their destinations by focusing on a particular image in their mind, a unique room in their home, a distinctive sandy shore, outcropping of rock or comrade's face. They had built their floating citadel, year sigh, in the years following their escape from the minions. They could not return there and report to the great mind empty-handed. 
but they could rest elsewhere and resume their quest. We will meet again, son of de Gaulle, Remick raved. We will meet again. The elves hacked at their fading forms, but only wisps of smoke existed where they had been, and then soon faded. Many sentients lay dead upon the floor. I have a spell that will allow us to pursue them, Jason Tulin said. Let them go. <clears throat> it will be a long time before he has the strength to challenge us again. But we could finish them all now, Carnage said. Their leader might do that for us, but for now, we have a mission to complete. We'll just have to be ready when Vermic tries again. Perhaps enough blood has been shed today, Olak suggested. I know that I've shed as much as I want to, Kayla said, spitting out a loose tooth. I could use a little patching up, Lieutenant T. Of course. Tend to the wounded, Jason said, and search their bodies. We may find something useful. <clears throat> Vremic, son of Ilion. Their frantic escape had made precise arrival within the, within the astral realm impossible. Luckily, they hadn't appeared within the walls of Yersai, or inside the territorial dominion of their arch-enemies, the Forsaken. Instead, they had landed in the astral wilds, and there they made a hasty camp upon a tall, rocky outcropping, surrounded on all sides by dense forest and tangled undergrowth. Vremick surveyed his surroundings from the precipice, the warm astral winds animating his clothing as he tried to discern their location. I believe that we are just south of the Celestial Ridge, Supreme Leader, the Knight Sai Ignatius said. Beyond it lies the dark pools of discord and then the realms of limbo. How far is it to the nearest settlement? If I am correct, the town of Tugrin Sai lies three days to the west. Ha! The garrison of my nephew Sai Mishka lies there. He commands, commands a thousand soldiers. He will grant us the help that we need. Indeed, he may join us himself. Oblesk, I would have a word with you now. Yes, Supreme Leader. Dravian Oblesk, Vermic roared. By the hand of the great mind, I should have you tortured in the festering gullet of a giant worm. I knew that you would regroup here, my lord. It was logical for me to assume that you would have need of your chief sorcerer. Oh, and what need could I possibly have for a coward in my elite force? I know why the elves were immune to our powers. I discovered the secret in the mind of their witch. They must have possessed magic items that shielded their minds. That is what I thought at first, my lord, but the black witch revealed that the secret lay in the walls of that mind. Some property of the stone interferes with magic and apparently our minds as well. So then they'll not fare so well on another field. No, my lord. Excellent. Then we still have a chance. More than a chance, indeed. Once we have recovered our strength, we will choose our battlefield more carefully. Our tragedy requires punishment. Twenty-eight knights entered into battle today, and only nine remain. Whatever the cost, I must recover the sword of my father. Dravian, tend to the wounded. If any of them die, then you will die with them. Yes, Supreme Leader. I must meditate and contact my nephew Mishka. He will send us a new company of men. And we will train them harder than ever. Save my wounded knights, Dravian. We cannot afford any more losses. Mend them, and then we march for two Grinsai. Very soon, the son of de Gaulle will rue the day that he met Vremic, son of Ilion. The mine. <clears throat> you did well, Jason, Draco said. Nearly thirty sentients against our eight, and yet we still live. We got lucky. Without the protection of the mineral deposits, we may all have died. It may have been necessary to have surrendered the sword in that case, Olak said. I fear that we may well have rekindled the war. My father taught me much about sentient ways, Jason said, until Vremic has failed. It will be his sole responsibility to reclaim it. The great mind will not consider war until he has utterly lost. He is certain to make another attempt, Draco said, and next time he won't underestimate you. 
My destiny and that, was, and that of the sword will be revealed in time. Until then, I will follow the first principle of the Drakkar Noir, that without great enemies, Olak said, one can never achieve one's utmost potential. And many great enemies died today, Jason said. Their handicap saved our mission, but made it only a half victory. Maybe Tulunic, Tulina can cast a blessing upon them and speed them on their way to wherever it is that sentient knights go when they die. Their spirits are wholly evil, she said. They'd probably be happier without my blessing. Then to hell with them, Carnage said. They attacked us without honor. They deserve no pity of ours. Little talk of blessings followed that simply stated fact. There was simply too much to be done in too little time. Sergeant Braidwick, Lieutenant de Gaulle said, Report. <clears throat> Nineteen enemies dead, sir. Twelve regulars, one upper rank, a captain, I think, three warlocks, three high-ranking knights, and four burnt beyond recognition. Their swords are okay, but their armor and belongings are ruined. Did you find anything special? There are fifteen suits of armor, so full of gems, that we could all retire on them. Their great swords are enchanted and nearly priceless as well. I found ten rings and three wands that I assume are magical. The wizard that McCune killed had one of our trans-dimensional bags of holding, with at least five thousand coins in it. I also found a map on the dead captain. I'm not sure, but I think that it's a map of their lands in the astral plane. Give the rings and wands to Tolina for identification. Stuff as much of the rest of it as you can into that bag. Work fast. We leave as soon as Tolina can patch us up. Aye, sir. <clears throat> McCune, you're on watch. New Mason, as soon as you're able to, take point and keep an eye out for trouble. They went to work quickly and quietly. The bodies of the dead were hidden inside a cross passage and buried with debris. It was an arduous task, but in a brief time it seemed as if the battle had never been. Tulina was a talented physician and a gifted priestess. She was able to bandage or magically heal the entire squad within an hour. Powerful spells that she did not possess were required to heal Kayla's teeth, but they were all once again ready to march. The way through the mine proved to be easier from that point on. The tunnels were quiet and empty, except for many years of dust and debris carried in by animals. They hiked for two miles more before they finally came to the elevator shaft. A new dilemma quickly became evident, because the dwarves' ropes and pulleys had long since fallen into ruin. Far above them, a tiny point of light lanced down and for any other beings, escape would only be possible after a hopeless climb along sheer quarried walls. It was not so for the Dark Alfar, for in ages past they had grown in tune with the natural energies of under-earth, and they had learned how to harness its power to accomplish supernatural things. By focusing their wills, they could borrow that power and use it to levitate, rising up on the warm currents of an unseen wind. It was not a fast process, but it was somewhat faster than a walk and somewhat slower than sprinting. It most certainly was faster than climbing and far more silent. On Jason's signal, they rose up the shaft in their usual formation. In the lightless mine, they were like darkness itself, climbing higher, crawling toward the light, challenging its supremacy. They moved like shadows within darkness, and to anyone who might witness it, it would seem that the night itself had eyes. Wraith-like, they floated up, sometimes using their hands and feet to guide themselves across the face of the stone, but usually just ascending vertically as their minds willed them. Near the top, they encountered a colony of bats. Their shrieking cries filled the air as they flew off in a panic. Soon after, they came to the end of the shaft. The elevator ended in a great gaping cavern. A company of humanoid creatures lay slaughtered upon the ground, their cookfire still smoldering beneath the wild boar carcass, now overdone. <clears throat> Goblins, Sergeant Newason observed, must have been Vremic. They all died by the sword, most by one quick thrust as if they were standing still. 
Their psychic powers are extremely effective against primitive minds, Jason said. They had no chance. Be wary, Draco said. They might have missed a few. However, if they had, they either were in hiding or far away, for none showed themselves. Amazing, Sergeant Carnage said. The fortifications are still intact. I wonder why the hill dwarves abandoned it. There were still countless untapped veins of mithril, I am sure, McCune said. A fortune was left behind, and easily defended from here. It has well-buttressed walls, siege defenses, weapons, and a good water supply. It's a mystery best left for another day, Lieutenant de Gaulle said. We need to complete our mission and return to the safety of the pyramid. Only a few hundred feet remain between us and daylight. They stood for a while, surveying the scene. The mouth of the elevator shaft was located in a vast hall, behind the defensive outer walls of the mine. On the southern wall, several sets of stairs wound up the natural cavern face and entered the mountain at various points. Great stone fortifications defended each natural exit of the immense cave that was the origin of the mine. Before them, a wide ramp began, equipped with carts and rails and leading due north toward the shattered gate and then the world beyond. The gate houses were still intact, but what may have befallen the original builders remained hidden. Outside, it was twilight, but whether or not it was dawn or dusk would only unfold in time. Fan out, Jason ordered. Battle formation. Signaling to each soldier in turn, he directed their movements, indicating to them where to focus their attention. Up the ramp they went, cloaked and quiet, ever ready for trouble. The great ramp had once been the focal point of an immense operation. Several tons of mithril ore would pass through the gates each day, on its way to smelting and the final extraction into its nearly priceless, refined state. However, what had been was not what now was, for time and decay had begun their great work of decline. Approaching the innermost gatehouses proved uneventful. The gates themselves had been smashed inward, some incredible forces must have been at work to destroy them, but whether or not it was a natural event or the invincible fists of a titan remained a mystery. The gatehouses were still much intact, albeit their doors were now gone and their form with former tenants departed. Animal bones littered the entranceways, and it seemed that the goblins had enjoyed many years of uninterrupted living. A quick search of the towers revealed offset stairwells, and a multi-level engineering that would make it highly defensible by only a few men. The crenellated rooftop overlooked an inner courtyard, bisected by a wide but now dry moat. Tunnels exited and the ramparts into the mountain to both the east and west. One set of stairs led up and the other down. All was quiet. Halt the search, Jason signaled. Let's move on. Moving beneath the arches of the first wall brought them to the courtyard. A massive stone bridge crossed the moat. McCune, check it out. It's rigged to fall, but the pull pins are rusted in place. There's no way to collapse it now. Fanning out, they crossed the bridge one at a time, each providing protective cover for the others. Fifty feet more, and the second wall and gates rose from the cavern floor massively built and cunningly incorporated into the sides of the mountain. The remains of its portcullis stood twisted into a gigantic knot. Beyond it, the outer gates rested a slinger's throw from their archway. Sundered from their once mighty hinges and ripped outward, they were now cracked, rotten, and ruined. What being could have torn it free, they thought, but what force may have done it seemed too terrible to imagine. Engineered like the inner gates, the second set of gatehouses were both thicker and mightier still. Searching the towers revealed a similar system of stairs and passages, with hidden arrow slits and murder holes directed both outside and toward the inner keep. The uppermost, the uppermost defenses consisted of a great balcony overlooking the road to the front gates. It had once been complete with a catapult and ballista. 
Beneath it, five funneling chutes could deliver boiling oil upon the heads of attackers below. Hidden passageways provided an escape route for overrun defenders. The outer wall was truly a defensive marvel, but like the first, only vermin and ghosts from the past populated it. They peered outside cautiously, like gophers leaving their burrows, and soon found that they were alone. The time was indeed the gray hour before nightfall, and a lonely road wound away, wound away from the mine and off to the northeast. They had reached the beginning of the road that Draco and Olak would have to travel alone. Round and above them, a vast and spiny mountain range loomed, surrounded by snow-capped peaks. A heavily forested valley lay below them. The remnants of the dwarves' mining town began at the base of the mountain and extended throughout the valley. The village looked abandoned, but from their vantage point it remained uncertain. The stars began to twinkle, and for the first time during their long journey, Jason dared speech. Our journey together has come to an end for now, gentlemen. We will camp here and rest for a while. I believe that we've earned a moment's reprieve before we go our separate ways. It has been a long road, Olak said. A meal and a few hours of sleep should put the spring back into our steps. As long as we leave well before dawn, Draco said, I'd like to get past that village before sunrise. We will take watch while you rest, Jason said. You should have plenty of time. Agreed. I'll take first watch. Braidwick, prepare a meal. Right away, sir. And I've got just the thing, Carnage said. I brought along a chain of Frenthian sausages, a little rice, some spice, and we're in business. After a time, they had all eaten their fill, and Feldwin's only regret was that he would run out of food. Thank you, Braidwick, Draco said, for an excellent meal. Yes, delicious, Olak agreed. And after a bit of small talk, they all retired to sleep for a while. They were exhausted from battle, travel, and always being on guard. Their bedrolls felt like the softest down. They woke too soon. Lieutenant Olak, sir, New Mason said, it is time. The sun will rise in two hours. Thank you, Sergeant. We'd never have made it without your courage. It seemed to me, sir, that you didn't need our help at all. We all have our limitations. Thankfully, I didn't exceed mine. It was an honor, sir. Please ask Sergeant, Sergeant Goldsmith to see me. Yes, sir. Sergeant Goldsmith, Olak said, before we leave, I just thought that you should know that we share the same master. Master Lee? Yes. And just as he matched your body to the spear, he matched mine to the sword. Train with him as much as you can. It will help you in the days to come. I will, sir. Carry on. Yes, sir. And it seemed to all her comrades that there was new quickness in her steps and a pride in her shoulders from that day forward. The team packed quickly, storing bedrolls and checking equipment. They were ready to move out. Will you return through the mine? Olak asked. That way is too dangerous. We'll travel through the spider mirror instead. Then farewell, Jason de Gaulle, Draco said. Your father would have been proud. Watch your backs. We always do. They then parted with firm handshakes and a better understanding of each other. Olak and Draco loped down the hillside. They followed the old road, but stayed well off it in order to avoid potential ambushers. Shortly thereafter, their forms disappeared into the landscape. Jason moved his team back inside, activating the spider mirror's portal filled the chamber with its eerie, bluish glow. Quickly adjusting the third and fifth legs to their forward position, he set the coordinates for the secret meeting place. After signaling to his team, they each stepped through the gateway in turn. He was the last to leave. An instant later, the portal was gone, and the fortress of King Rodman's mine was once again as silent as the grave. Olak and Draco moved swiftly, following the course that they had memorized days earlier. The mining town was now a ghost town. The old citizens had long since departed. Most of the wooden structures had rotted away, but a few still stood or leaned with age and decay. Their foundations remained strong, 
testimony to the building prowess of the dwarves. The goblins had clearly been over it many times, searching for tools or implements of war, for their tracks and scat littered the ground in many places. Olak looked for signs of life as they passed, but only the wind spoke to his ears. The old mining town of Thorn Mountain was dead, and in a few centuries it would fade into history. It's for the best, Draco said. Now the secret of our arrival is assured. And indeed it was, for no birds, insects, or mammals were out on that cold night to witness their passing. If everything went well, then they would re reach Linnea in a few days' time, and there they would seek out Kristoff, the assassin. Okay, that's where we'll end episode 7 on page 86. Next episode and. So eight, we'll start with the journey to Linnea on page 87. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great night.